So, without further ado, Carol Howell is here, and we're really excited. She's the director of the Founding Museum, and you're going to speak to us about uh, how artists save lives. Exciting. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Do you want me to speak into this? Is this helpful? Uh, yes. Cool. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Morning. Um, I. Do any of you know the Foundling Museum? Ah, cool. Okay. Uh, the Foundling Museum is about a ten-minute walk from the British Museum uh, on Brunswick Square, um, and this work of art is one of the most important works in the collection. This was. 275 years ago, this was given to a charity which had only established itself the year before, in 1739. And the charity was the Family Hospital. And it was the UK's first children's charity. And coincidentally, it also became the UK's first public art gallery. And I think the story of the Family Hospital is one of, uh, I think, fits perfectly into the idea of momentum. The Foundling Hospital was the brainchild of the man in this painting, Thomas Coram. Thomas Coram, in many ways, was an incredibly ordinary man, very limited education, grew up in the West Country, sent to sea at 11, and proved to be a very gifted seaman, and ended up establishing the first shipbuilding business outside Boston in America. He came back to London in the 1720s, in the kind of final third of his professional life, and he was horrified by what he saw, which was children and babies abandoned on the streets of London. At that time, London was expanding enormously. There was the agrarian um, uh, influx into the city, that there was a huge population explosion, that what were the local parishes and the parish-based halls were no longer able to cope with uh, the rise of need, effectively. The poor laws were becoming increasingly punitive. Uh, the language of the workhouse, which arrived in 1722, the idea of the deserving and the undeserving poor, the work shy, the feckless language is all returning to our vocabulary now. For women who, for whatever reason, couldn't keep their children through widowhood, through poverty, or through illegitimacy, there was nowhere but the workhouse for them to take their children. And the workhouse had a 95% mortality rate for children under five. They were called killing nurses, the nurses who worked in the workhouses. So the situation was really desperate. And Coram, who was a, a great champion of lost causes uh, in America, he tried to campaign for land rights for the Mexicans, um, for the end of primogeniture, um, and for the establishment of the Anglican Church, which in America at the time was not a, not a good, great thing. He saw this, and as a man, and as a husband, but not as a father, yeah. he realized that something yeah. had to be done. Yeah. Across Europe, there were Catholic foundling hospitals, Catholic run, usually by um, um, nuns. But of course, with Henry VIII and the break from church, there wasn't that system in the UK. As a man of, uh, as a, as a man of relative uh, wealth, but no real influence. He had a battle on his hands because in the 18th century, if you wanted to establish a charity, you needed the permission of the king. You needed a royal charter. So Coram had a battle on his hands and he decided to do what now seems to us so obvious because so much of what went into the establishment of the family hospital is what we now take for granted as the way you would go about getting something off the ground. He made a list, and we have his pocketbook in the museum, he made a list of all of the most wealthy and influential men in London at the time, the privy councillors, the members of the aristocracy, members of parliament. And he went, he physically walked to their houses. He said he could walk up to 10 miles a day across London to knock on their doors, to introduce himself, to explain what he was trying to do, and to get them to sign his petition. Not unsurprisingly, the aristocratic men of the day were not interested in dealing with unwanted babies. They themselves were producing a great many of their own, I'm sure. Coram hit a complete brick wall. He then had the brilliant idea of approaching the women. And the first person to sign his petition was the Duchess of Somerset. He was extremely influential. He was about 18 or 19 at the time and just had her first child. And the first petition that he was able to put before the king was the ladies' petition. And these women then began working on their fathers and brothers and husbands. And gradually, Coram, support for Coram's idea grew. But when I say gradually, 
he finally got his royal charter after 17 and a half years of campaigning. Wow. So when we look at Jimmy Carter and this idea of men just not giving a damn, mm. there are good ones out there who do, and others who, as Jimmy Carter said, need mobilizing <laughs> one way or another. But the great men, like Coram, who don't give up, who hang in there for 17 and a half years. 1739, he is granted what he is holding in his hand, his royal charter, which you can see on display in the museum, and it lists the names of all of the men who put their, put their voice and, and, and um, character and, and reputation behind the establishment of the hospital. The project then began. You have your royal charter, you now have to actually build a family hospital to bring, to take in these babies, and they were all babies. They were under two months old when they were first admitted, and it subsequently became under a year old, and that is, it was always under a year old, so babies. So they were writing to the British ambassadors across Europe, all those ambassadors who were in cities that had family hospitals, please go and investigate for us. How many beds to a room? How many children to a bed? How many nurses? What is the laundry situation like? How do you feed these children? Really practical things. How are we going to do this? And they also set about trying to find land on which to build their hospital, which they found 52 acres of open pasture land in what is now Bloomsbury, <laughs> <laughs> um, at the top of Lands Convict Street. However, you have a brand new charity, and as we all know, you need to have a public image, you need a public face, you need to establish your brand in the minds of the public because the Foundling Hospital was entirely about individual subscriptions. It was private donations that got this enterprise off the ground. So it is the story of individuals coming together to help. At this point in the story, we bring in the artist who painted this work, the great British artist William Hogarth. Hogarth was a friend of Corn's and had been part of the a kind of very early supporter he is there on the Royal Charter. He was there at the granting of the Royal Charter. He was there on the night of the first admission. He was back the next day for the first committee meeting to see what was happening with the children and how they were getting on. But his first act for his friend, Thomas Coram, and for the hospital was to design effectively its logo. He designed its coat of arms. And what's wonderful about this coat of arms and the sketch for it, again, is in the museum, is that its motto is a single word and the word is in English, and the word is help. It's as simple as that, you go straight to the point. And I've said before that when I look at it, I always think of Band-Aid and Bob, Bob Geldof and that, give us your money. You know, there is, there's no real need to beat around the bush, help. We need it, you can give it, that's the point. And that coat of arms was winched above the temporary accommodation in March 1741 when the first babies were admitted. He would go on to design the uniforms for the children, which were still being worn in the 1950s. He, who was also childless, would foster children with his wife. He also, he lived in Chiswick, where a number of the wet nurses were, because the children were wet nursed for the first five years of their life outside of London. He was an inspector of wet nurses. He was involved in all aspects of the hospital's life, but in 1740, he donated to the hospital this full-length portrait of the great, his great friend, Thomas Coram. And what's beautiful about it is the way that it has been painted by a self-taught painter is a masterclass in the Baroque. He has set his friend up, this humble seaman, um, as great as any aristocrat or king. We literally look up at him with his great swags, but he is not wearing a wig, he has his own hair. His face is sunblasted from years spent at sea and hard work, and his little feet don't touch the ground, partly because he was very dynamic, but also because he was quite short. Um, <laughs> he's a man of action. This was the first donation of art. Hogarth was also running the only art school in London at the time, and he was desperately trying to establish a school of British art. If you were a man or woman of elegance and you were buying art, you were buying French and Italian, you were going on the grand tour. British artists, if you employed them, you employed to paint your horse or your dog or possibly your wife. But not really serious art. And Hogarth, this is what Hogarth was campaigning against. He was running his own campaign. Hogarth realised, because he was so smart and such an entrepreneur, that there was a perfect situation here. 
The hospital was trying to make itself known to the public, it was trying to attract individuals to come and see the work it was doing and give money <coughs> to support the cause. Hogarth was trying to display or trying to uh, promote the work that he and his contemporaries at the art school he ran, the best that they could do. This enormous new building was going up just on the outskirts of London. It had a lot of empty wall space. And so he persuaded all of the leading artists of the day, um, Hudson, Ramsey, a 21-year-old Thomas Gainsborough, to give work, to donate work. And all the artists did. They gave their work. And taking their lead from their friend, Hogarth, and here, which is at eye level when you're looking at the painting, very prominently, painted and given by William Hogarth. And a lot of the art in the collection, you see, gift of John Sanderson, fake it at the knob it, I made it, I gave it. So this idea of philanthropy, creative philanthropy, but also enlightened self-interest. Because sure enough, people came to see the contemporary art, and once they were there, they could see the work the hospital was doing with the children, and they were encouraged to give money. And at the same time, they were able to see the best that British artists could do, and hopefully commission them to do work for them. And it wasn't just painters, it was sculptors, it was master masons, it was plasterers, it was clockmakers, it was ironmongers. They all got involved. That all of these individuals looked at what Coram was trying to do, believed in the cause, looked at their own skill set, and go, what could I do as, a, as a, an ironmonger? What can I do as a decorative plasterwork artist? How about? So Handel came on board and gave annual benefit concerts of the Messiah in the chapel, which raised in those days millions of pounds. And it was the artists who helped establish the family hospital to become one of the most fashionable places to visit in London at the time. And it took off as a charity. And it continues today as the adoption charity Corum. So 276 years later, this charity is still going. But, and if we can have the next slide, what we do at the museum is to keep this momentum going. But our aim as a museum is to inspire people to make positive change in society by, by celebrating the role of individuals and the arts in changing lives and changing lives for good. And we are in a situation where our children's curriculum is being stripped of creativity, where our Minister for Education is on record as telling young people not to study the arts at higher education if they want a good job. We tell the story of the way that artists saved children's lives, and they did it through their art, and they continue to do this work. So out front, we would, this is a commission from the artist Claire Toomey, um, she made this work for us. It's over a thousand cups and saucers. Working with the public, she got suggestions for good deeds. At the simplest, smile more. At the most complicated, foster a child. Each one of these individual deeds was put on the base of a cup and in the indentation of its matching saucer. So every one of the 1,150 cups was different. Each day of the exhibition, 10 people were selected at random. It was a lottery system in the 18th century for getting your children in, so Claire wanted that random lottery system. 10 people were selected. They could go down and, from all of the cups, choose one. The rule was you got one chance. You choose the cup, you pick it up. If you agree to do the deed on the bottom of the cup, you can keep the cup. Saucer stays, so there's a record of the deed that is out there being done. If you can't do the deed for whatever reason, you put it back, and there's no other chance. Like the women in the 18th century, you drew a ball, it was a yes or a no. Your baby got in, your baby wasn't accepted. We then asked people to feed back to us what they were doing, how they were doing their deeds. And the Tumblr feed, I've got it written down, I should have put it up. I promise you, I cannot read the Tumblr feed without tearing up, because it's amazing. People have just go to extraordinary lengths. There's one where I love is saying, my husband, who is not an art lover, <laughs> it turned out, was clocking different deeds that had been exposed in the sources, so other people's deeds, and he just decided to do them. So he was going off to people going, I was told a lot of them were like, give five pounds to a particular charity. I did, didn't know this charity. I did research this charity. I went to visit them. I'm extremely impressed. I've now become a friend. I'm giving a monthly donation of people would pick up cups that spoke to their own situation. An amazing comment going, I picked up a cup. 
It's for a charity that deals with children who are going through bereavement. My brother was killed in a car accident when I was 16. I wish this charity had existed when I was a young man. I'm thrilled to be supporting this charity and I will go on supporting this charity. Just amazing. And of course, so many of these comments end with, and it's amazing that the tradition continues. It's amazing that these artists, or that Claire has reminded us that we all have the capacity as individuals to make life better for other people. You go, yes, and it takes the artist to remind you to be that agent in society, that agency to make you see that connection. So an awful lot of the work we do with contemporary artists is about enabling our visitors to make that connection between the past and the present and to do it in ways that are creative. Final slide. But back of house, we also continue that DNA of enabling great artists, of, and when I say artists, I mean of all disciplines, writers, uh, musicians, poets, animators, painters, to work alongside some of the most vulnerable and marginalized children in our city, and to enable them to see life's possibilities and to see themselves in different ways, going in different paths. And artists are extraordinary role models for young people, particularly if they feel themselves to be overlooked, ignored, and without a voice because artists are masters of their ownership, and artists do not wait for other people to tell them that what is success and what is failure, which direction they should be going in. They determine these things for themselves, and they head on out doing what they do regardless, because it is a compulsion, and it may or may not be successful, but that most of us know artists who are not successful in the terms that Nicky Morgan might lay out. But they know what they're doing, they are, masters of their own ship. And for young people, this is an incredibly powerful role model to have. And to give you an idea, this is a project which we were, uh, were running last year. We have an ongoing project in Great Ormond Street Hospital, working with children in the hospital school. Currently, we're working in the transplant ward and bringing artists in to work, in the case of the transplant ward at the moment, each child is in isolation, has challenges in terms of making all the equipment sterile as we go from child to child. But to give you an idea, the project we've just completed was an animation project with these uh, children. And some of them, they just flew, because even before they were ill, they'd never had the chance to do animation. And there's actually really quite cheap software available. And a number of the parents have now bought the software so that their children are continuing to make animation on the wards. And it's also something that they are looking forward to when they leave, so that they can continue this work. And the work that we produce with these young people, who, as I said, are very often, because they're in pupil referral units, they're refugees, they're in children's homes, they're in Great Ormond Street Hospital, they are very invisible in the world. And the great thing about the museum is that it tells these young people that they have ancestors, and their ancestors go back nearly 300 years, and there is a museum to them and their ancestors. And the work that they do with us is given a presence. It is on display in the first gallery people go into, into the introductory gallery, making that link between Hogarth and Handel, Dickens in the 19th century, the great artists we're working with now. And the lovely thing about the Great Ormond Street project is that we discovered that parents were using it as that added incentive and the thing to look forward to. Because when you get out, you can come and see the work in the museum, it's on display in the museum. Although the great thing about the animation project is that it was both on display in the wards next door to their by on bed entertainment unit and it's on display in the museum. And I think we have a visitor's book, which is a very remarkable thing. There's something about the museum which enables people to feel that they can, that in the, in the same way that they are bearing witness to the women and the thousands of children who went through the hospital from 1741 to 1953. And there are several hundred former pupils who are still alive when we work with, and that's another completely extraordinary story of momentum and growth. That in the process of bearing witness to these stories of separation and loss and hope and generosity and imagination, that they open up to us, it becomes a sharing, a receiving of stories and a giving of stories. And I think the conversations that we hear in the spaces and what the comments that are left in the visitor book are, are amazing. And it means that our aim 
which is quite a radical one for a small independent art museum, the aim to be to inspire people to make a positive change in society by celebrating the power of individuals and the arts to change lives. It is an ongoing story, and much like Claire's project, our job is to remind people, A, that we as a society need artists, and B, they, every single one of them who comes through our doors, and us as staff, have the power to make the world better. We just have to decide to do it. Thank you.